Hi and welcome to the Monsters Who Murder YouTube channel. My name's Amanda Howard. I'm a criminologist and I'm often called the serial killer whisperer because I talk to a lot of serial killers. Um, this is actually in association with our podcast called Monsters Who Murder, but this is actually going to be more about uh, the case files as well as looking at body language and other psychological features of serial killers as well as mass murderers and other violent criminals. Um, if you haven't been here before, welcome. Um, if you have been here before, well, then you know what I do and you know how I do it. Um, so stay tuned today. We're actually looking at the body language of Ed Kemper. I'm going to grab a couple of different interviews from a couple of different places on YouTube and just go through them and just sort of show you the different tics and mannerisms of a serial killer. So let's get started. So a Kemper is about to enter for an interview. This is from 1991. This is raw footage. So there is a lot of outtakes and everything, which is often better to see rather than the formalized uh, edits and cuts that we see on television. So let's have a look. Okay, instantly we have, we have something very exciting to look at. Um, now, Ed Kemper is six foot nine, so he's very, very tall, which makes this man who's shaking his hand, who I guess is the producer, he's actually quite tall himself, so he would be well over six foot himself. And I think uh, Kemper here is actually a bit disappointed that he isn't uh, a lot shorter than him, so he couldn't exhibit more dominance, but he's still giving a, a dominant stance. And as we can see, uh, the man is actually shaking his hand and facing Kemper. Kemper is actually facing the camera, which is a very interesting point. It proves where his focus is, and it's not on this man, though he's making eye contact. It's more about the dominance and the way he's able to actually take control of the scene. So let's continue. I guess I didn't even ask him that. Just proper now he, information. So I just pause it again for a second. He he's actually talking about um, his own execution and what has happened instead. So it's very interesting the word choices he has here. That he wouldn't hesitate a second to pull the pull the lever on any serial killer, right? And I'm thinking, gee, he just killed me. You know. If you stop and think about it, if I were to. Uh, if I were to have been uh, executed in a timely fashion, they would have had absolutely no input. Okay, so he's talking about the many interviews he's done. He's actually one of the most interviewed serial killers of all time, if you ask me. Um, uh, another killer who has been uh, interviewed many times and many will not call him a killer but he is and that's Charles Manson he's done many many interviews over the decades as well before his passing uh, but Kemper is still one of those that sort of featured a lot especially in the 80s and 90s so this is 1991 that we're actually watching now and as you can see he's got his arms crossed and he's really trying to prove that he is the most important person in the room He's um, standing up when, you know, there's plenty of chairs around that he could be sitting down and he's still slightly facing the camera, as you can see there. So it's not just about um, everyone else. It's about him portraying what he wants to, to the audience. The audience isn't the people in the room. It's the people behind the camera. Can they be scratching their heads about what makes a serial murderer tick? And here he's, um, he's sort of showing how important he is by saying, you know, had they just executed me, you wouldn't have all of this information and you wouldn't be more uh, intelligent when it comes to dealing with serial killers and everything. He's trying to make sure that people know that he's in charge in this room and that he could just shut up and not say a word as if he was executed. So, you know, he, it's, it's about um, needing to sort of go towards what he wants and not just about um, who he is other than the experts all jumping up to give their opinions, which you've been doing for a lot of years. Guilty as charged, I'm sorry, but this is what we do, Ed, and this is what we will continue to do, and this is how we learn. So um, obviously I'm not interviewing him myself. I have tried, but he said no. But it's quite interesting that he is a bit, a bit cranky, um, and there's obviously something that will tweak him a bit further uh, the further we get into this, so we'll just see. And unfortunately, they don't hit too well. They don't have too good of a track record. I'm not sure whose name. We need to put one specific name down here. Who should we? Uh, you feel me? 
I would love to have had a cross back there to his face because he was talking and saying how important he was and everything. And the woman at, at the table didn't even look up and she was more talking about how to fill in the forms than anything else. He would have been pissed there and we don't actually have that, but we will continue. And would include serial killer, obviously. Yeah, but uh, yeah. obviously very few of them could if there's yes. only 35 serial killers. <laughs> no, no, they're talking about uh, close to 100. Uh, right now, I was saying that ten yeah. years ago. <laughs> That's uh, that wasn't done. Because you also have to, you also have to include. No, no, I'm saying and his cohorts. Yeah, they were saying as a unit. Mm. The PSU was saying, and uh, again, uh, this is what what you call resume stacking. So he's sort of talking about that. Um, whoever these people are that are interviewing him, they aren't as important as the people that he has talked to, which is the BSU, which is the Behavioural Science Unit at the FBI, which is what Mindhunter is based on all of that. So he's saying, you know, if, if the smartest minds try to in interview me, I don't know what you think you're going to get out of me because I've done all of this before. And I'm far too important to actually sort of give you the good stuff when I've given it to other people. Uh, having come from that genre in the uh, having been locked up and through the dregs and knowing some of those characters and watching how easy it was for me to stumble into what I did. Uh, I didn't go into it pre-planned or anything, but uh, I couldn't believe that that was an, a, a, a unique act. Now this is um, like they haven't even started the formal interview yet and he's still standing up and he's already giving dialogue. So he's already uh, setting the scene for what he wants to talk about. Um, as you can see, he touched his chin a fair bit. That's just sort of, you know, an, an aggressive stance. Women are more likely to have grabbed their necks um, as a submissive stance. Um, some men do it too, but mostly females. I know there is a meme of um, uh, Robert Downey Jr. doing this and it's and it's used a lot, but he's sort of touching his, his chin. So it's more about, um, you know, just, just the dominance, you know, rather than sort of chest pumping, he's actually sort of doing it with his chin. You know, that no one else could find that out. And that's just one avenue into it. Because, you know, while a lot of people can stereotype the type of uh, criminal that a serial killer would be, society has to loosen up its belt a bit and admit that jailers, like at the uh, Tucker farm down in Arkansas, who get tired of recalcitrant troublemaker inmates, take them out back and kill them and bury them, are serial killers. And this harks back to that very basic of um, arguments, you know, that, that politicians are serial killers and army sergeants and all of this. So he's he's talking about um, some of the jails that actually do execute quicker than others. He's on this theme of you're lucky you get to talk to me because I haven't been executed yet and he, he's not going to be executed. Um, and so there's more of that. He's, he's actually, um, on a side note, he's actually... Um, been up for parole a few times he's been uh refused each time but it is something that has come up a few times but this is you know 30 years ago that he filmed this different motive but uh so you know it's a wide range of activities that get included in something like that they've had that a hundred years ago in the old west where someone was set up a boarding house and people who came by never left mm -hmm. whole families individual travelers <laughs> So it's quite interesting here that he's actually talking about uh, other serial killers in history. So he's talking about the Bender family here um, who killed travellers who came to their property and um, were dispensed of for financial gain. He's actually showing here something that I often talk about in the fact that there is more than one sort of serial killer. Most people tend to think about the sexual serial killers like Ed Kemper, Ted Bundy, people like that. There's so many other different ones. And as he's saying here, there is people with different motives who become serial killers, just that some we label them as serial killers and some we don't. Like the executioner at any execution can be called a serial killer if they use the same person over and over again. And as we know, like in England, they use the Pierpoint family for many, many years. Um, are they serial killers? And this is what he's trying to say. So he's just rambling. This is about him uh, making sure that the conversation goes where he wants it to. He's not letting them ask questions. This is not the formal part of the interview. So he's rambling here just to get his points across. It would go on for years before they get discovered. 
but um, it's things I've read about. Yeah, and you had H.H. H. Holmes also in the 18... 19- <laughs> it said there on the screen H.H. H. Jones instead of H.H. H. Holmes. That's quite funny. Anyway, that's just me. 90s mm-hmm. and stuff, yeah. Poisoners, yeah. people like that. Um, are we starting our interview or...? No, we don't. Just- uh, that was excellent. So it just proves that um, he's basically trying to make himself look like he's a busy, important businessman who um, who has other things to do than stand here and uh, chat away about random things like serial killers. But um, he has all the time in the world. They have as much time as it takes to do the recording. So it's quite interesting there that um, he actually asked that question. Uh, let's go and have a look at a different video now. So we're looking at another interview now. It's called Forgiven, as you can see on the screen. I don't actually know much about this or when it was filmed. It was definitely after the last one that we've done. So um, we're starting at the beginning after the intro just to see a little bit of how he starts this interview quite differently. Thank you, Ed, for talking with us today. How long have you been in prison? 17 years. Did you believe in God when you first came to prison? When I first came to prison, I had been a baptized Christian, a fundamentalist uh, Protestant Christian on the streets uh, some years before. And I got caught up in a lot of trinkets, a lot of flashy things. As you can see, he's a bit different here because of the reason for his story. So the last one was about him being a serial killer. Now this is about Ed the Christian. So this is going to be fun. I'm not going to go on forever and ever with this one, I promise. Um, those that don't know, um, I have a very bitter view about uh, serial killers and finding Jesus. So we will just see what happens here and we'll just play a bit of this now. Um, involvements that were not Christian, that were not wholesome. And I completely fell away from my faith and from my devotion to Christ. See how he blinks when he says Christ. So um, he's not comfortable doing this. This is a very different way for him to talk. Um, I'm not quite sure when this was. I thought it was after the other one, but I could be wrong there because the camera looked a bit dodgy at the start. But um, that's a professional term. (laughs) But anyway, um, this is straight to camera, straight down the lens. So the last one was he was sort of in charge. And this is more about... Um, pray for me and hopefully I find Jesus and I get to go to heaven. So you're going to see a more um, pious person this time, not the boastful, I'm a serial killer. Everyone's a serial killer. We just don't give them different labels. When I came to prison, there was a lot of distraction in here too, but also there was a lot of time to contemplate, a lot of time to think about all the damage that happened to me and people around me. Um, a lot of damage happened to him. So he's now the victim in all of this and that this is a very noisy place to be when he, he just wants the quiet and, and seclusion that he, he rightly deserves apparently. So um, he is trying very hard to come across as a very good Christian boy here. He's trying to search for the words and he's highly intelligent, but he's trying to search for the words he needs to say Um, to put it into the right context because as you can see we've now got the pleading eyes the glasses are gone so we're not getting the um the the glare back from his glasses that would have happened had he decided to wear them so um he's very clean shaven as you can see and he just sort of is really trying to look humble Look, look at his forehead it's completely smooth so it's not raised eyebrows it's not um piercing stare he's actually trying to make his eyes look a bit more doe-eyed rather than you know the intense stare that he often does have because of my attitude because of life out there distractions out there and not facing up to some real problems i needed to deal with we have to also remember too that this is a man that even at 15 and 19 when he was still um in in custody that he actually was able to uh, learn the right things to say and the way to beat all of the psychological tests and everything. So he knows he how to do this in the exact same way. He, he's just been asked now how he um, is today compared to the serial killer he was who went to prison. So let's see his answer. Um, it's possible for people to be more relaxed with me than with some other people. Um, 
it might well be thought to be an uptight situation. I'm a very large person, six foot nine, weigh about 350 pounds. And you would think someone that large is going to be prone toward violence and aggression and uh, over. No, not at all. So um, he's actually trying to stereotype now. And he's actually said um, in, in his confessions and everything that women felt comfortable and easy around him because he was like that big protective teddy bear kind of persona. So he's actually trying to make it look like now that um, people uh, misjudge him purely because of his size, when in fact, he has said previously that it is because of his size that people felt safe. Bearing personality. And I'm working toward quite the opposite. So I'd, I would say the difference between 16, 17 years ago, where I was considered friendly and easygoing person, that was a facade. Now it's real. I'm just going to play that again. Just have a listen to this. Uh, overbearing personality. And I'm working toward quite the opposite. So I'd, I would say the difference between 16, 17 years ago, where I was considered friendly an easygoing person that was a facade now it's real of course so we found god and now he's a kind and gentle person the fact that he raped and murdered women means absolutely nothing to him so um he's 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 a converted boy he's done he's ready to to um have jesus in his heart and he's ready to go out on the streets because now he means it now he's going to be a nice person that he wasn't before are you concerned about what people on the street think of you? People on the streets that could be of great benefit to the... Ah, did you see that? So he wants to sound really lovely and caring here, but he is fuming at the noise that's going on. Watch him breathe through his nose quite heavily. So... Um, yeah, this is good. About what people on the street think of you. People on the streets that could be of great benefit to the... See it? He, he, um, he is agitated. He's just rocked from side to side. He's just clasped his mouth together. He's biting his lip. He wants to scream out to the people behind him to shut the F up, but he knows that he can't. So he is really trying to uh, portray this image and the jail behind him is how it normally is and he's not happy. So he's trying to look like he's, he's contemplating. He's just turned that anger around into a smile. This is what they do. He's just compartmentalized that because he knows what he wants to say. He knows what he wants to do, but he's now holding on to that to answer once that sort of sound dies down. Repeat it at least once. Come on. <clears throat> let, let me rephrase that from your early childhood and a mother who at the very least mentally abused you to the victim's families who in some instances have hated you how do you deal with all this negativity that's one thing that those emotions being spent on a person brings to the fore is the whether you have an ability to deal with it or not and if you don't you learn one or you fall because it's a real trap hatred uh, revenge vengeance uh, retribution it's interesting how often people say that that's the Greek way. They put some class to it and say that's a classic Greek uh, statement, that uh, at least with the revenge, there's some kind of solace. And I don't really believe that. I think that's a cop out. And it's easy for me to say that being a violent criminal in, in my past. See all this blinking? So throughout this a moment ago, he didn't blink at all. And then once he started to talk about the criminality of his life, he actually starts to blink quite a lot. Let's watch that again. Because it's a real trap. Hatred, uh, revenge, vengeance, no uh, retribution. It's interesting how often people say that that's the Greek way. They put some class to it and say that's a classic Greek uh, statement. That uh, at least with the revenge, there's some kind of solace. And I don't really believe that. I think that's a cop out. And it's easy for me to say that being a violent criminal <laughs> in my past. See that. But... I haven't had to deal with feelings directly related to murder, to retribution, to forgiveness, 
in all of my life until I became this, until I lived this for 17 solid years. In fact, and what he means is this is a prisoner. So, um, you know, he's, he's talking about stoicism and, you know, the Spartan way of life. It wasn't the Greek way of life. But anyway, um, we will continue. And he's saying that it's it's being because he's been in prison that he's actually found his true self. This is something that we hear over and over again. It's a trope. It really is. I don't believe a second of it. And reading his um, uh, parole hearings that he's had since then, God and Jesus do not come up. There is no religion there whatsoever. So this is just a cop out that he thought would work. And obviously it doesn't. So he, he dumps that real quick. 22 out of the last 25 years. And uh, I'm in for life. I'm doing life. I'm not satisfied with that. I accept it. It's something that took a long time to accept. And I'm not serving a sentence, but I'm not trying to beat anyone out of the retribution. I'm living a life. I won't waste a life again. If he could do it over again, he wouldn't have killed all those women. The fact that he killed over and over and over again is the part that seems to be lost in a lot of these interviews. You came to Christ at the point you accepted responsibility for all the murders. Yet I understand it happened in an unlikely place. And so now we're actually going to get his, his story of his path to Jesus. So be prepared. Look for all, all the clues and hints of what he is saying without saying it. Where was that? In the hole. Did we see that again? Did you see that, that tense mouth? Watch. In an unlikely time in the lockup. Where was that? See it? And it happened in an unlikely place. Okay, so he's about to discuss how he found Jesus and when he found Jesus. Um, watch his mouth. There is going to be a, a micro expression of anger before he sucks in his mouth, closes his eyes and tries to go on with his story about how he found Jesus. Where was they? In the hole, doing time in the lockup. Um, I could just squander my life away, waste it away to, to nothing, quietly die in a little corner or start living my life. And it was over a period of months. It was very ugly. It's the worst place I've ever lived in my life and it's the best place I've ever lived because during that three years there, I came to grips with myself, with my feelings, with who I was. I became a human being for the first time in my life. Do you think he believed that? He actually closed his eyes when he said human being. He doesn't consider himself a human being. He believes that he's a monster. Instead of a caricature. What would your life be like without Jesus Christ? If Christ were not in my life now, if peace were not in my life, if love were not in my life, I'd probably be dead. If I weren't, I'd be wishing I was dead. Although you will probably never be released, you once told me that if you got out, you'd go far away. Where? There's a lot of missionary work out there and a lot of people in the world. This is what you don't get to see on the podcast is, is my frustration at the bullshit. So let's just go back again that he's going to go out there and do missionary work. I don't know Christ and won't know Christ unless people lay down the comforts and the fun things, the fast cars and nifty watches and the cute girlfriends and the telephones and go somewhere where the mosquitoes are as big as hummingbirds. And the alligators bite and uh, share the word and share the peace and ask them to exchange ritual and tradition and history for something that works with other people. Yeah, no, he's, he's sprouting what he thinks he needs to. So he would have used this at his uh, next parole hearing. You look at me, I'm a good Jesus boy now. Um, it's, it's it's all fantasy and even he can't stop himself from trying to hide the lies because he, he knows that he, he doesn't believe a word of what he's saying. But obviously uh, this is for a religious channel. And so he thought that, you know, look, look at what I've done with my life. I'm, I'm trying to turn it around. I want to get out of jail and go and do missionary work. Yeah, right. So anyway, we will stop this one here because I have enough religion for the day and we'll go and check out another one. So let's see what else we've got. 
So this is another interview with Ed Kemper. I don't know the age of this one yet, but we will see what we've got. I altered, well, they weren't really spontaneous. I altered how I approached these young ladies from the point of capture from the first time. What I had wanted to do was to secure them and to suffocate them with plastic bags over their heads. Okay, as we can see, he has on his glasses. He's not making eye contact. He's actually fiddling in front of him. How different is this to the last interview? So the last interview he's talking about, I found God and I'm now amazing and everything. And now he's actually talking about the crimes. Um, and but we can see that he's actually more relaxed during this interview talking about that than he was about talking about Jesus and, and religion. I had some completely unrealistic uh, perspective that that was quick, that they would lose consciousness rapidly. So many killers don't realize that it is really hard to kill someone. And um, we all expect to be like in the movies where, you know, you can choke someone and they're unconscious and they don't wake up and they're dead. And that's what he's found here is that by suffocating them in plastic bags and things like that, it just doesn't work. Um, but it's also um, along those lines of not wanting to cause harm, but still kill, if that makes sense. But the first young lady that was in the back seat, it was uh, Mary Ann Pesh. I finally secured her. She argued a lot. She was dialoguing, trying to change up control of the situation. She had already decided I was in control. I was trying to gain control. I was convinced she was in control of it. So he's trying to say that, you know, that this was a battle of control, that she was in control, but he needed to be control. And she was saying that he was in control. Um, it's a he said, she said sort of situation, but she ended up dead. So we know who was in control. Um, he's, he's, the, the head down is um, a bit of regret and possibly remorse, but I doubt it. So for about 20 minutes, we were arguing back and forth over what was going to happen. And I was trying to keep it away from what was intended, which was murder. And I decided at that time I wasn't going to tell anyone I was going to rape them. I didn't say that at the time, but I left that wide open as the avenue that I was, it's going to be a sexual release. And it's amazing uh, doing uh, BTK on the podcast where actually he talks about release as well. They use these different terms instead of, you know, I need to get my rocks off or, or, or something more colloquial colloquial um he just likes to sort of use these random words instead of and it's something that a lot of serial killers seem to do and it's um, and with the ones that i've interviewed over the years very few of them swear very few of them are anything but polite and it's because they try and show this because they don't want you to see the monster if you see the monster you're you're done for so they don't show that unless they know that what they're going to do is going to happen and that got them very distressed. And it was obvious to me that if I was going to pursue what I was doing, that distress had to stop. So I went into a, unfortunately, more effective behavior of letting them help me. I let more of my personality come out and I was suicidal, uh, very disturbed, grasping out at someone. I had abducted them and I was now he brings up a very important point here and it's actually quite interesting. It's something that I've noticed that most females do and this isn't a sexist thing, but we are raised to say sorry. We are raised to um, not offend. And what happens is like he's done here where he's changed the dialogue and sort of said, oh, I just need someone to talk to. A woman is not gonna go well, get lost. I, I have better things to do with my time. It'll be, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, and, and, and we put on that caring uh, cap, basically. We actually feel like that we need to help someone who's in crisis and we don't realise that um, it's at our own detriment sometimes. So many times people will come to you and say, you know, and just blurt something out of you that, that can offend you. And your instant response is, oh, I'm sorry, you know, like I didn't realise that happened. We apologise way too much. And he learned that, that by playing women at their own game essentially that he was going to win because women 
it's it's in, inbred and I stop myself from saying sorry so often because I'm trying to teach my children that you don't have to be sorry for someone else's effect. So it is important that um, this is something that we learn, you know, women have been abducted purely because they didn't want to offend the guy when they had no interest in that then, you know, some of them get raped and murdered. It's not every person I know. And this is a very, very broad generalization. And um, so I don't need hate, believe me, but this is what he's done. He's realized that coming at them as the aggressor wasn't getting him where he needed to be. Whereas coming at them as I need your help and I need your care that he was getting his, his victims far more readily, you know, catch more flies with honey kind of thing. I wasn't going to let them out of the car because I was tired of people walking away from me. So some of that was very true, but I, I manipulated that to allow them to help me to the point of resolving their behavior. Okay, scratching of the head. It's usually towards the back of the neck, but that was almost close. He's agitated by talking about this. That is is something that happens. So, but basically, you know, it's like someone walking over your grave. Scratching the back of your neck means you're irritated. So we'll just go back and see that again. To help me to the point of resolving their behavior until we got to a place where they could be killed. And that has, I have the biggest problem with that on a guilt basis because obviously that entailed unusual trust between the, uh, the captor or the perpetrator and the victim of the crime. Yeah, exactly. At one point, in fact, on the uh, fourth victim of the crime. And it was uh, also the development of the passion. If I was drove, they died, like the last two victims. I was so pissed I'd have killed anybody who got in the car. But there was times I drove a woman and her son clear up into Oregon, crossed over to the coast highway and drove back down. And like 8, 30, 9 o'clock at night, fog, misty highway, and I'm driving along. There's not a car near me. I'm, it's totally Alien County. This is way up around Eureka or something. And here's these two high, probably high school girls. They looked up at me 17 or 18 years old. They're hitching the first ride into town because they've snuck off the farm. They've gone the half a mile or so off to the road, and they're going to hit on into town, have a good time, and sneak back. It was obvious because they were grabbing the first ride they could get. And here I've been fighting my inner impulses to not go off on this woman and her 12-year-old son who's hitchhiking clear back to Seattle, right? And I'm struggling with these feelings. I don't want to do it. Man, you ought to do it anyway. You're weak. You're a punk. Nah, I don't want to do it. We've gone back to the 1991 interview here. Now he's talking about the selection of victims and he's basically blaming them. So, you know, that uh, he has this inner dialogue and so many killers talk about their inner dialogue. Um, and a lot of us do have that doesn't make you a serial killer, I promise. But um, what he's doing here is saying that people do stupid things and so they deserve to be killed they deserve to be picked up by a serial killer but he's saying you know look at the goodness i have in me because i didn't kill them all day long i'm doing this and by the time i'm coming back down that highway i'm exhausted i'm saying oh whoa and i'm driving along just to get home and here's a perfect situation i cannot get busted it exceeds the criterion of picking someone up and not getting caught no one knows me in the county. No one's seen me going through it, right? It's a fog shroud at night. Nobody could even see me if their home was in view. And I don't know them. I picked them up. We drove into town about two miles, three miles. I dropped them off. I got some gas and kept right on going. I was not in a proper state of mind to do something like that. It so I know a good man because I didn't kill those two people. Don't worry about the other eight. That, that, that's fine. But I didn't kill these two. You know, and he's very emotive here. Um, we see him at other times and he's actually quite still, but he is him showing exasperation at the fact that, you know, he didn't kill everyone. So, you know, there has to be some good in me rather than it's because if you keep killing people all the time, it takes a, a psychological toll. And he wasn't, as he said, in, in the right frame to do this. It blew me away. I couldn't believe it. It was like it's handed to me on a platter. It scared the hell out of me. I couldn't do it. I had everything I needed. And to go back to your first... Uh... Again, so about the selection and the preparation. If I was selecting and preparing and everything was all set, that's it. I got them. 
but I didn't. They're not dead. That, I show that as an example of many times that kind of thing happened. All of a sudden, somebody shows up out of nowhere. I pick them up, take them where they're going, but I didn't do nothing to them because it was, uh, the mindset was all wrong. The only time that people got killed was when she and I was fighting like cats and dogs, and I couldn't deal with it. I couldn't vent it any other way. Okay, so now it's his mother's fault. Yes, he was psychologically abused by his mother. He was a religious fanatic, which is quite interesting that he he found God that way. Um, but uh, this is something that does come up, that it's usually when there is life stresses for these serial killers that they do act out. So it's interesting, um, had they kept a very detailed diary of when they attacked and what was happening in their home life, we would see this again and again that um, some killers actually just go out because they need to blow off steam. And the way they blow off steam is killing someone and destroying something because they can't destroy the, the focus of their anger and their issues. And the fact that he rubbed his eyes there, I mean, this proves that he's really staring down the barrel. He's not blinking. He's actually quite focused on what he has to say. And, you know, it's all about everyone else's to blame but him. So these young girls are blamed because they went out and just picked up the first ride they can. He was killing because his mother was being mean to him and he had no other uh, outlet for it. I mean, he could have taken up cricket, you know. But anyway. I look back on it and I'm not saying I'm right or wrong. I'm just saying I'm looking back, I'll go back on it and saying, I think they were surrogates. I was killing her, not them. I was attacking her station. I was attacking her stance in that university setting. Also, I hated the university for what it was doing to her. She worked her butt off. They took every bit of it. Oh. Always for the reason, always, you know, there's all of this that's going on. And this is why I did it. I hated the university. So I attacked university girls. I hated the university because it affected my mother. I hated my mother because she was being abusive to me. It's this cycle and they try and force that sort of sense of what's going on and how they feel about it to actually uh, create a reasoning that sounds pretty standard to them. But to the rest of us, it's like, that's not an excuse to go out and kill people. We all have fights with our parents. There's um, many abusive parents out there that whose children don't become serial killers. So, uh, you know, it's not an excuse. Oh yeah, we love that. Okay, here's some more. You want some more authority? You want some more responsibility? Here. It was eating her up. She went into that job sober. She came out of the job damn near canned because she went to work drunk one day. She couldn't cope with it, and it was destroying her a little at a time. She needed help, but if you told her she needed a mental if I told her she needed a mental hospital, if my little sister told her she needed a mental hospital or a dry out program that peeled our skin for us, we did not mess with that woman. My sister, my little sister, was cheating on her husband when my mother was murdered. If she had known my little sister was doing that, she'd have, she probably would have been out of the family. So her, his little sister was uh, cheating on her husband when, her, when their mother was murdered. He killed his mother. Like, he just made that distance happen that he didn't kill her. So not um, my sister was cheating on her husband when I killed mum. No, it's when mum was murdered. So, you know, it's just they distance themselves. And though he's talking about the other victims saying, you know, I could have killed those girls that got into my car. Now what we're talking about his, his, his most focused victim uh, being his mother, he actually made it a very distant. And it was very different to how he talked about the other victims. That was totally outrageous to her Victorian mores as she grew up. This twisted Victorian bullshit uh, ideals that her mother laid on her as a kid and twisted her life with. And then she tried to run that shit on my dad. You said you had a lot of sympathy and empathy towards Marianne Pesce when you talked to her. But isn't that strange to say that after you had killed her in such a brutal fashion? There was a draw. There was a draw to the young lady that was haunting. I'm not saying I had compassion toward her when I talked to her. I tried to remember what we talked about. And in fact, I think what I said about her was is that she epitomized what really drove me. She was a haughty young lady. She's kind of stuck up, distant. I look back on it and I see a girl that was not so I hope that you liked that. Uh, this is just a taste of what we're going to be doing. Um, I just wanted to have a play around, see if this works. 
if uh, the dual screen works, if the lighting works, if all, all of that works. So you are uh, the people in our MWM group on Facebook, which I will leave details below as well, um, actually got to vote and they wanted to see Kemper done first. This is, as I said, just a trial. And I know that um, there is a request for a deep dive on Kemper to be done. So we may do that in the future. Um, but this is just to, to sort of show a bit of his body language, a few ticks, just going over a couple of things once I've told you what there is. Um, but there will be plenty more. This is just episode one. So I will have a lot more to go through. So tell me what you think. I hope that you like this. Um, happy to answer any questions in the comments below or in the Facebook group for MWM Confessions, which is our shortened name of Monsters Who Murder Serial Killer Confessions. Um, so until next time, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. I hope you'll give the podcast a try if you haven't already. And I'll see you next time. See ya.